बिठो अठारह बच्चे हैं मैं फॉरवर्ड करके देख लू जरा लेक्चर है फॉरवर्ड करके देख लो फिर दोबारा तुम अब किधर जा रहे हो उस वक्त वो स्टार्ट नहीं होना <laughs> नहीं मैं मैं कर रहा हूँ अब कुछ आगे थोड़ा सा देख लू
assalamu alaikum students uh, yesterday we started with the male genital system and we were discussing the topic of uh, crypt orthodism and crypt orthodism is basically an undescended testes students i aapko meri awaaz aa rahi hai hello hello yes ma'am awaaz aa rahi hai acha 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 Only 47 students हैं, बाकी किधर हैं सारे? It's already 8:37 और uh, मैं already seven minutes मैंने आप लोगों का wait किया है. Now I'm going to start the lecture. No more waiting. So uh, we discussed the fact that the congenital anomalies they include cryptorchidism, which is undescended testes. absence of one or both testes or there is fusion of the testes which is known as syn orthodism humne crypt orthodism ki definition bhi kar li thi humne ye sara kuch kar liya tha that it is characterized now this is a diagram this is a picture and this is showing that on the left side is a normal seminiferous tubule showing all phases of development of the spermato from the germ cells to the primary spermatocytes the secondary spermatocytes the spermatids and then the mature sperms with tail now this on the right hand side is a tubule which a seminiferous tubule which which is showing the testicular atrophy which is a feature of crypt orchidism the tubules are showing thickening of the basement this is the basement membrane it is thickened and these are the there is a loss of the germ cells aur ye jo lambe lambe cells beech mein pade hain these are the supporting sertoli cells only there is no spermatogenesis and interstitial these are the interstitial cells of leydig ye jo hain ye as compared yahan pe aap dekho ke ye kam hai राइट लेफ्ट वाली साइड में ये कम है दीज आर दिंक योसिनोफिलिक लेडिक सेल्स एंड ऑन द राइट आप देखो कि बिकॉज सेमिनेफ्रिस ट्यूब्यूल की ए ट्रोफी हो गई है तो एज अ कॉम्पेंसेटरी रिस्पॉन्स ये लेडिक सेल्स का हाइपरटेक्स क्या हुआ ये पिंक पिंक जो इर्द गिर्द सेमिनेफ्रिस ट्यूब्यूल की बाउंड्री के बाहर है दोज आदर लेडिक सेल अब द इम्पोर्टेंस of an undescended testes is that it is associated with a greater risk of developing testicular cancer than is the descended testes lekin ek cheez yaad rakhna ki even the descended testes agar undescended testes mein uh, cancer develop ho raha hai to descended testes may be develop kar jayega because both of the is testicular because both testes are getting influenced by the same predisposing factors which are associated with the development of testicular cancer now during the first year of life ab humne kal padha tha ke do stages hain ek iski abdominal stage of descent hai aur ek iski inguinal scrotal stage of descent hai during the first year of life normally in a normal child the inguinal crypt orchid testes it descends spontaneously into its normal location which is the scrotum but if it does not descend it should descend during the first year but if it does not descend in that case you have to surgically perform an operation which is known as orchiplexy and then you have to correct that defect and place the testicle back into the scrotum you have to place it into its location that is the scrotum and this operation conventionally it used to be done within 2 years of age lekin now the current protocol is that this does not guarantee ke the fertility of the child will be maintained when he grows up so ab jo current protocols hain recent surgical protocols hain that this orchiplexy should be done within 6 to 12 months jab bachcha infant Uh, 6 to 12 months ka us waqt ye surgery of an undescended testes ka deni chahiye so orchiplexy is the surgical procedure in which there is placement of the testes into the scrotal tract but 
this process does not guarantee fertility. Even in uh, surgically placed testes, 10 to 60% will still report deficient spermatogenesis. So the current recommendation is that those alke bajaye, six to 12 months of age pe humne surgically correction kar deni hai. And this is a very important point jahan pe teen star dale mein, that cancer malignancy may even develop in the normal contralaterally descended testes supporting the concept that there is a defect in testicular development and cell differentiation which is operable on both the testicles on the descended testes as well as on the undescended testes but i again in jara So the complications of an undescended testes, that is sterility and testicular cancer. Testicular cancer develops in these undescended testes with a frequency of three to five fold higher as compared to the normal testes. As compared to normal descended testes, uh, crypt orchid testes is three to four, it has three to four fold higher chances of developing testicular cancer. So one complication is sterility. Number two is the development of testicular cancer. Number three is that an inguinal testes, because it is not located in the scrotum, a scrotum may testes is relatively protected because dono limbs ke dhirnyan mein aapka scrotum aajata But if it lies in the inguinal region, it is prone to trauma and crushing because the inguinal region is more exposed. Inguinal hernia is also going to develop in 20% cases. So these are the four complications of an undescended testes. We can skip this, but these are the causes of uh, decreased fertility. Progressive atherosclerotic narrowing of the blood supply, but that occurs in old age. Old age mein fertility ki itni zarurat nahi hai. Then it occurs as an end stage of an inflammatory process. Inflammation of the testes is known as orchitis, and inflammation of the epididymis is known as epididymitis. Cryptor, these are the causes of decreased fertility. Atherosclerotic narrowing, inflammatory orchitis, cryptorchidism, some endocrine disorder from the brain, hypopituitarism, generalized malnutrition, cachexia, undernourished boys, irradiation, which is usually done in that area for some other cause, for some enlarged inguinal lymph nodes or whatever, uh, if there is a lymphoma, prolonged administration of anti-androgens, which are usually done as a treatment for cancer of the prostate. Prostate ke cancer may because it is androgen dependent, so we do anti-androgen therapy. Karte so prostate ke cancer ke liye jab hum anti-androgen therapy karte hai, so in that case, that is also associated with a decreased fertility. And then there is a, a primary failure of genetic origin such as Klinefelter syndrome. So inflammatory conditions may, um, they are more common in the epididymis as compared to the Testes. Okay, testes ke saath hi upar epididymis hota hai. Aur phir ek spermatic cord hoti hai. Aur uske saath the testes is hanging with the help of a spermatic cord. The important inflammatory disorders are non-specific inflammations and specific inflammations. Non-specific inflammations ko hum keh denge, they are non-specific epididymitis and orchitis. And non-specific mein granulomatous orchitis bhi aaj. Specific inflammations may remember that mumps is a very important cause of uh, mumps uh, is a very important cause of orchitis. Mumps orchitis. But when there mumps, the one complication of mumps is mumps orchitis. And if mumps develops in old age, it is a disease of children. But if mumps develops in the uh, in an uh, in a middle aged person. In that case, that can be associated with infertility. So mumps orchitis, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, 
is very common in the epididymis as compared to the testes itself. So, usko kehte hai, tuberculous epididymitis. That is more common as compared to tuberculous orchitis. The syphilis is a very important cause of orchitis. Syphilitic orchitis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, trachomatis, these are the specific inflammations which affect the testes. Non-specific inflammations are the autoimmune and non-specific. So non-specific is usually due to an extension from an upper urinary tract infection. Specific inflammations, these are the causative uh, agents. Tuberculosis, mumps, syphilis, nizeria, gonorrhea, and chlamydia, trachomatis. So we can skip this. This is, on the right, is a normal testes. This is a normal testes. And on the left is a testes which has been, this is a testes which has been replaced by an abscess. This is an abscess. This is normal testes. This is an abscess. You can skip these. Mumps orchitis is an important cause of sterility if it develops in the reproductive age group. Tuberculosis is more uh, prevalent in the epididymis as compared to the testes, but later tuberculous epididymitis can involve the testes. And as you all know, that tuberculosis is associated with the development of granulomas. Syphilis is an, also another very important infection of the testes. And syphilis is associated with gamma formation and obliterative end arthritis. This is testicular torsion. You can see that the testes has become gangrenous. Torsion arm tor pe, uski jo spermatic cord hoti wahan se hoti. This is uh, left testicle, this is right, this is the spermatic cord. This area se torsion ho. Jab torsion ho egi, to blood supply band ho jayegi, blood supply band ho egi, to there is going to be, there is going to be gangrene. Achha. Now we have tumors, spermatic cord and parathyroid. You just have to remember the names. Spermatic cord, mein, the commonest tumor is the lipo. Spermatic cord, mein, the commonest tumor is the lipo, benign tumor. Spermatic cord, ka commonest tumor is lipoma. And paratesticular, paratesticular is the area surrounding the testes. That is adenomatoid. Okay? This is just the name of Malignant testicular, malignant spermatic cord and paratesticular. Remember that these are not testicular tumors in the true sense. These are paratesticular, the tumors which arise outside the region of the testes. Malignant may bacho may rhabdomyosarcoma hoga or adults may liposarcoma. So char tumors, benign and malignant may karlo. Benign may ajata lipoma and adenomatoid tumor or malignant mein bachon mein aa jayega rhabdomyosarcoma or adults mein aa jayega liposarcoma so char tumors hain which occur in the paratesticular tissues now we come on to the main topic and that is testicular tumors now the testicular tumors jaise humne female mein humne panch categories mein divide kiya tha males mein hum bas do categories mein divide karenge that is the germ cell tumors and the sex cord stromal tumors Two categories only. Germ cell tumors and the sex cord stromal tumors. And then you can put a third category, which are the miscellaneous tumors. So the germ cell tumors are again divided into two types. Those which are of seminomatous tumors. And then we have isme ajata seminoma, which I told you repeatedly ke iska jo ovarian counterpart hai, usko kehte hai. Ovarian counterpart ko kya kehte hai, bacho? Bacho, awaaz aa rahi hai? Hello? Hello? Ji, ma'am, aa rahi hai awaaz. Awaaz aa rahi hai, toh bacho, bolte kyun nahi ho? Acha, mainne aap logon ko ek cheez kal per soon chauth, teen din se bata rahi ho. Ke female mein 
एक ट्यूमर होता है जिसको हम कहते हैं डिसजर्मिनोमा बताया है कि नहीं बोलो भाई yes, आवाज आ रही है ना तो जो उसका मेल काउंटर पार्ट जो टेस्टिस में आकर करता है उसको सेमिनोमा कहते हैं ठीक है फीमेल में उसको कहते हैं डिसजर्मिनोमा मेल टेस्टिस में उसको कहते हैं सेमिनोमा ठीक है अब सेमिनोमेटस ट्यूमर्स में आ जाता है सेमिनोमा एंड स्पर्मेटोसिटिक सेमिनोमा न्यू टर्मिनोलॉजी में द वर्ड स्पर्मेटोसिटिक सेमिनोमा हैज बीन रिप्लेस्ड बाय स्पर्मेटोसिटिक ट्यूमर सो जर्म सेल में आ जाते हैं हमारे सेमिनोमेटस ट्यूमर्स ऑफ विच द बेस्ट एग्जाम्पल इज द सेमिनोमा एंड द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट इज द सेमिनोमा एंड इन दिस सेम कैटेगरी वी हैव द नॉन सेमिनोमेटस जर्म सेल ट्यूमर्स non seminomatous germ cell tumors are embryonal carcinoma yolk sac tumor corio carcinoma and teratoma ab aap dekho ki these are the same tumors which occur in the ovary these are the same tumors ovary ke bhi jo germ cell tumors the unme yahi categories thi usme dysgerminoma tha teratoma tha yolk sac tumor tha embryonal carcinoma tha wo hi tumors जो फीमेल ओके उसमें हमने पढ़े हैं ओवेरियन ट्यूमर्स में पढ़े दोज आर द सेम ट्यूमर्स विच आर एप्लीकेबल इन द टेस्ट इन द कैटेगरी ऑफ जर्म सेल ट्यूमर्स देन वी हैव द सेक्स कॉट स्ट्रोमल ट्यूमर द जर्म सेल ट्यूमर्स दे कॉन्स्टिट्यूट नाइनटी फाइव परसेंट ऑफ द टेस्टिकुलर ट्यूमर्स और सबसे कॉमन ट्यूमर है दैट इज द सेम सेक्स कॉट स्ट्रोमल ट्यूमर्स जो हैं उनमें आ जाते हैं लेडेक सेल ट्यूमर एंड सटोली सेल ट्यूमर ये भी हमने ओवरी में इनके भी नाम पढ़े हैं लेडिक सेल ट्यूमर एंड सटोली सेल ठीक है ये हमने ओवरी में भी सेक्स कॉट स्टोमल की कैटेगरी में हमने ओवरी में लेडिक सेल ट्यूमर सटोली सेल ट्यूमर और एक बड़ा इंपॉर्टेंट ट्यूमर हमने फीमेल ओवेरियन ट्यूमर में पढ़ा है इन द सेक्स कॉट स्टोमल कैटेगरी एंड दैट वॉज कौन सा था जो मैंने कहा था इम्तिहान में भी आता है कल तो पढ़ा है बच्चों क्या पढ़ा था जो इनहिबिन पॉजिटिव है वो कौन सा ट्यूमर था कल तो बताया बेटा आप लोगों को कौन बताएगा बच्चों बोलो कौन सा ट्यूमर था बच्चों अच्छा अब मैं आगे नहीं जा रही अगर आप लोग बताओगे तो इट मींस के देर इज नो यूज इन डिलीवरिंग दीज लेक्चर्स अगर आप लोगों ने पढ़ना ही नहीं है सुनना भी नहीं है कितनी दफा एक बात रिपीट करती हूं सेक्स कॉट स्टोमल ट्यूमर्स में हमने कौन कौन से पढ़े थे बच्चों कोई तो बताए ना नोट्स खोल के देख लो बुक खोल के देख लो बेटा ग्रेन्यूलोजा सेल ट्यूमर ग्रेन्यूलोजा सेल ट्यूमर जिसको हमने कल दो में डिवाइड किया था अडल्ट ग्रेन्यूलोजा सेल ट्यूमर एंड जूवेनाइल ग्रेन्यूलोजा सेल ट्यूमर वो हमने कल सेक्स कॉट स्टोमल ट्यूमर्स की कैटेगरी में कड़ा किया था और मैंने आप लोगों को बताया था ये इन्हें बिन पॉजिटिव होता है उसमें छोटे छोटे माइक्रोस्कोपी पे छोटे छोटे राउंडेड ग्लैंड लाइक स्ट्रक्चर्स होते हैं जिनको हम कहते हैं काल एग्जनर बॉडीज वो कहते हैं इनहिबिन पॉजिटिव होता है और मैंने ये भी बताया था इट इज एसोसिएटेड विद ईस्ट्रोजन सिक्रीशन एक्सेसिव अमाउंट ऑफ ईस्ट्रोजन सिक्रीशन विच इज एसोसिएटेड विद कॉजिंग प्रोलिफरेटिव ब्रेस्ट डिजीज इट कॉजेज एंडोमीट्रियल हाइपरप्लेजिया इट कॉजेज एंडोमीट्रियल कार्सिनोमा बताया था कि नहीं बताया था बताया था कि नहीं बताया था बच्चों बोलो तो सही ना जी मैम बताया था बताया था तो बोलते क्यों नहीं हो सिर्फ एक बच्ची बोल रही है हम ना बाकी किधर है वेर इज द सी आर वेर इज द सी आर एंड वेर इज द जी आर किधर गए सारे बच्चे सो रहे हैं अटेंडेंस लगा के सो रहे हैं
हम ना सिर्फ आप बैठे हुए ऑनलाइन ऑनलाइन है कौन मैम पार्टिसिपेंट्स uh, तो सारे हैं जाग रहे हैं पार्टिसिपेंट्स तो सेवेंटी वन है वो तो बेटा मुझे नजर आ रहे हैं लेकिन बोल तो कोई भी नहीं रहा एक्सेप्ट यू बाकी किधर है सो गए हैं दोबारा नो मैम मैम जाग रहे हैं तो बोलते क्यों नहीं हो रहे हो तो बोलते क्यों नहीं हो बोलते क्यों नहीं हो आप लोग आप लोगों को मैं इम्पोर्टेंट रेडी टू लिसन टू एनी सॉरी मैम देखो अगर आप लोगों का बेटा इस तरह का तो हम लोगों का भी दिल नहीं करता आप लोगों की हेल्प करने को इट इज अ म्यूचुअल थिंग बेटा आप लोगों का देखो एग्जाम की डेट पहले आ गई वी आर ट्राइंग टू हेल्प यू पीपल लेकिन आप लोग खुद ही नहीं चाह रहे कि आप लोगों की हेल्प की जाए देखो पढ़ना तो बेटा तुम लोगों ने खुद है ना दिमाग तो तुम लोगों ने अपना वो करना है ना यू हैव टू यूज योर ब्रेन मेमोराइज आप लोगों ने करना है हम तो आप लोगों को बता सकते हैं ना सो द जर्म सेल ट्यूमर्स दे कॉन्स्टिट्यूट एंड इसका मतलब है कि हम भी ना आप लोगों के साथ मेहनत ना करें इसी तरह हम आप लोगों को बस फारक कर दें जो आप लोगों का एटीट्यूड है So the germ cell tumor, फायदा कोई नहीं है ना आप लोगों के साथ दिमाग खपाने का द जर्म सेल ट्यूमर्स दे आर नाइंटी फाइव परसेंट एंड ऑल ऑफ दम आर मेडिकेट द सेक्स कॉट स्ट्रोमल कैटेगरी में आ जाते हैं सटोली एंड द लेडिक सेल ट्यूमर्स एंड दे आर कॉन्स्टिट्यूट फाइव परसेंट एंड दे आर द बिनाइन ट्यूमर and the testicular neoplasms they are the most important cause of painless testicular enlargement and increased frequency is seen in an undescended testes and testicular dysgenesis regarding the classification we can divide the testicular tumors into two categories ye bhi pehle bhi maine bataya seminomas and non seminomatous germ cell tumors the seminomas they usually remain confined to the testes for a longer duration of time and they are usually detected when they are at stage 1 stage 1 wo hoti hai when the tumor is confined to the test and 70% cases of seminomas usually are in stage 1 and lymphatic spread is much more common as compared to the hematogenous spread regarding the seminoma and metastatic uh, spread usually occurs to the para aortic retro peritoneal lymph nodes and distant spread is usually rare as compared to the seminoma the non seminomatous germ cell tumors they usually present at a higher stage that is stage 2 and stage 3 when the tumor has uh, progressed beyond the confines of the testes and these tumors they metastasize earlier both hematogenously as well as lymphatic spread but hematogenous spread is much earlier and more frequent as compared to ye dono ka ulta ho gaya theek hai predisposing factors most important environmental factors then we have testicular dysgenesis syndromes that is tds which include crypt orchidism which is undescended testes hypospadias and poor sperm quality so testicular dysgenesis syndrome is the combination of crypt orchidism hypospadias and poor sperm quality klinefelter syndrome is associated with a 50 times greater risk for developing mediastinal germ cell tumor dekho ek cheez yaad rakhna hai ki jo germ cell tumors hai wo ovary mein bhi occur karte hain टेस्टीज में भी अकर करते हैं सेक्रोकॉक्सीजियल एरिया में भी अकर करते हैं एंड दे आल्सो अकर इन द मीडियस्टाइन ठीक है ये सारे लोकेशन है जहां जहां जर्म सेल्स माइग्रेट करते हैं डियरिंग इंट्रा यूट्राइन लाइफ सो क्लाइन फिल्टर सिंड्रोम में मीडियस्टाइनल जर्म सेल ट्यूमर्स की ग्रेटर रिस्क है फिफ्टी टाइम्स ग्रेटर रिस्क बट नॉट टेस्टिकुलर कैंसर नाउ दिस वॉज जस्ट बाय द वे ये आपके क्लिनिकल उसके लिए मैंने बीच में डाल दिया लेकिन इट इज नॉट एसोसिएटेड विद इंक्रीज रिस्क फॉर डेवलपिंग टेस्टिकुलर कैंसर बट इट इज एसोसिएटेड विद्री टाइम्स 
greater risk for developing mediastinal germ cell tumors ye aap se surgery mein ya viva mein ye cheez puchi ja sakti hai ki do germ cell tumors occur only in the gonads that is only in the ovaries or testes so the answer is no they can occur in the sacrococcygeal region as well and they can occur in the mediastinum as well they can also occur in the brain jahan pe inko germinomas kehte hain so cryptorchidism or undescended testes is associated with ye baby pehle bhi bataya ki it is associated with a 3 to 4 fold greater risk of developing cancer not only in the undescended testes but also in the contralateral descended testes is also associated with an increased risk of cancer development then intersex syndromes like androgen insensitivity syndromes and gonadal dysgenesis that is pseudo hermaphrodites wagaira may be there are increased chances of developing testicular cancer then family histories brothers of males with germ cell tumors they have an 8 to 10 fold greater risk of developing testicular cancer fathers and sons they have four times higher risk of developing testicular cancer so there is a very strong family history which is associated with the development of testicular cancer i'm emphasizing on what this thing that the development of cancer in one testes is also associated with a marked increase in the development of cancer in the contralateral normally descended testes and regarding the mutational profile an isochromosome of the short arm of chromosome 12 which is written as i 12p p stands for the short arm of chromosome is found in all germ cell tumors regarding regardless of their histological type not only in the seminomas they are also seen in the yolk sac tumors the embryonal carcinomas the teratomas jitne bhi germ cell tumors is category mein aa rahe hain unme there is the presence of an isochromosome of the short arm of chromosome 12 the precursor lesion of testicular seminoma is intra itgcn intratubular germ cell lesion now this intratubular germ cell lesion that this precursor lesion it is developed it is present in the fetal testes it arises in uterus it is developed it is present in the fetal testes and it stays it is present when the child is born and it and these precursor lesions this it remains dormant until puberty and after puberty it progresses into puberty ke baad it may progress into a germ cell tumor. it may develop either into seminomas or non seminomatous tumors and this precursor lesion it consists of primoidal germ cells these primoidal germ cells they are about twice the size of normal germ cells they are large they have large nuclei large clear cytoplasm and they are about twi twice the size of normal germ cells and these precursor lesions they express the markers oc3 and 4 which are transcription factors oc3 oc4 and nanoc which are transcription factors which maintain the pluripotency of the germ cells in addition these germ cells are also associated with having activating mutations in cket proto oncogene then isochromosome 12p is present now 50% of boys or males with intratubular germ cell neoplasia will develop if they have this precursor lesion 50% are ultimately going to develop germ cell tumors within 5 years and all of them are ultimately going to develop in the later phases of life all patients will ultimately within 5 years 50% are going to develop intratubular germ cell neoplasia agar hai to within 5 years 50% are going to develop invasive cancer invasive testicular cancer and after 5 years ultimately all of them 100% patients are going to develop invasive cancers now this is the this is intratubular germ cell ye jo bade bade cells aapko nazar aa rahe hain ek do teen char paanch This is intratubular germ cell neoplasia. 
This consists of atypical promoidal cells, large, and they are about twice the size. Ye, beech mein chote wale cells hain, they are the normal germ cells. And you can see that this intratubular germ cell, uh, these cells, they are twice the size. And they express the transcription factors, OCK3, 4, and nano. Seminomas, ka ovarian counterpart is the dysgerminoma. We have told it a lot, but I don't know why you don't understand it. And uh, they are not seen in children, not, never seen in infants. And they are seen in the third decade. They produce large bulky tumors, gray, white to yellow. Or isko aam taur pe bilkul, uh, it is known as uh, layman terms, mein isko also, uh, be, uh, also call it a potato tumor. Bilkul alu ki taran ka hota hai. And it is 10 times as large the, uh, as compared to the normal testicle. Testicular enlargement hai. 10 times, and remember that seminomas are associated with painless enlargement of the test. Pain nahi hoti. Molecular cytogenetics, isochromosome 12. And 25% are associated with activating mutations in the CKID proto-oncogene. Now this is a cut section showing the gross appearance of a seminoma. Bilkul alu ki ki shakal. This is the epididymis. This is another cut section. This is the scrotal sac. Now, regarding the morphological, these testes may seminoma pe aapke SCQs aate. Classify the germ cell tumors of the testes. Yeah, classify the tumors of the testes. Classify the germ cell tumors of the testes and describe yeah seminoma ya yeah, describe coroteratoma. Name the testicular germ cell tumor. So on a microscopic examination, this is a microscopic morphology. On microscopic examination, testicular seminomas are divided into three types. We have the typical seminoma, also known as the classical seminoma, the anaplastic seminoma, and then we have the spermatocytic seminoma. Ab isko spermatocytic seminoma nahi kehte, ab isko kehte spermatocytic tumor. And then there is a mixed category, just mein seminoma is mixed with other germ cell tumors. Yani ke seminoma ke saath humare paas yolk sac tumor a jayega, humare saath embryonal carcinoma ka combination a jayega, humare saath choreo carcinoma ka combination a jayega. So we have three main types of seminomas. Classical seminoma, anaplastic seminoma, and then we have the spermatocytic seminoma. The typical seminoma is composed of sheets of uniform cells. Bilkul vese hai, jaise kal mene dysgerminoma bataya tha. Usme large cells hai, well-defined cell boundaries and clear cytoplasm hai. And there is a large nucleus with prominent nucleoli. Then they, these tumors are disposed in the form of sheets and clusters separated by fibrous stroma, and that fibrous stroma is infiltrated by a lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate. Wohi exact morphology hai jo ovarian dysgerminoma. And the, what, the clear cytoplasm is due to the presence of glycogen. One or two very prominent nucleoli and 50% cases of seminomas contain an admixture of tumor giant cells, that is syncytiotrophoblast giant cells. And syncytiotrophoblast giant cells, as you all know, that they produce the hormone beta HCG, beta human chorionic gonadotrophin. So, and in some cases, uh, there is the presence of granulomas in a seminoma. Theke? Ye is the morphology of a typical seminoma that is the classical type of seminoma. Ab jo paas anaplastic now this is, uh, these are the seminoma cells, large clear cells with a, ly a lymphocytic infiltrate. This is OCT3-4 stain. This is highlighting the germ cells. Now the spermatocytic tumor is an uncommon tumor. It constitutes only one to 2%. It is, uh, it usually occurs, ab isme aur mein ye farak hai, it occurs in older individuals, body age ke individuals mein akar karta hai, males, body age ke uh, males mein akar karta hai, not in the 30 to 40 year age group. And in contrast to seminomas, isme 
क्लासिकल सेमिनोमा में और स्पर्मेटोसिटिक सेमिनोमा और स्पर्मेटोसिटिक ट्यूमर में ये फर्क है कि इट लैक्स द लिम्फोसिटिक इनफिल्ट्रेट इट डज नॉट कंटेन ग्रेन्यूलोमास एंड इट डज नॉट कंटेन द सिंसिटियोटोकोप्लास जॉइंट सेल्स इट इज इट डज नॉट शो एन एडमिक्सचर विद अदर जर्म सेल ट्यूमर हिस्टोलॉजीज इट इज नॉट एसोसिएटेड विद इंट्राट्यूबुलर जर्म सेल न्यूप्लेजिया इंट्राट्यूबुलर जर्म सेल न्यूप्लेजिया इज नॉट द प्रीडिस्पोजिंग फैक्टर फॉर स्पर्मेटोसिटिक ट्यूमर एंड इट डज नॉट मेटेस्टिस it is slow growing associated with an excellent prognosis it does not metastasize and it is not solid potato tumor ki tarah nahi hota aloo ki tarah nahi hota it is soft pale gray and on cut section it shows the presence of mucoid cysts now this is a spermatocytic seminoma और स्पर्मेटोसिटिक ट्यूमर isme teen tarah ke on histological examination it has three types of cells three cell populations all mixed medium sized these are the medium sized cells which are the most numerous ab aap is uh, picture mein bhi dekh rahe ho ki these medium sized or the intermediate cells are the most numerous these are the smaller sized and they resemble they resemble uh, lymphocytes or second, secondary spermatocyte chote hain aur jo chautisra chara ka cell hai this is the giant cell. तीन सेल्स आपको इस फिगर में नजर आ रहे हैं जॉइंट सेल्स आइदर दे कैन बी यूनी न्यूक्लियट और दे कैन बी मल्टी न्यूक्लियट और स्मॉल लिम्फोसाइट लाइक सेल्स और इंटरमीडिएट सो स्पर्मेटोसिटिक सेमेनोमा में तीन तरह के सेल्स हैं और इनमें जो क्रोमोटिन है द क्रोमोटिन इन द्रोमोटिन इन द इंटरमीडिएट साइज सेल्स the chromatin is described as having a spireme type of chromatin which is seen in the meiotic phase of non neoplastic spermatocyte bas itna yaad rakho ki inke jo nucleus ke andar jo chromatin hai that has been given a specific name that is known as a spireme type of chromatin pankhaj this is known as the spireme type of chromatin बेटा आप किधर से आए हो अच्छा सो द सेकेंड कैटेगरी इन द जर्म सेल ट्यूमर स्पर्मेट्रोसिटिक सेमिनोमा हमने कर ली है दैट कम्स अंडर द स्पर्मेट्रोसेमिनोमेटिस कैटेगरी अब नाउ वी हैव द नॉन सेमिनोमेटिस जर्म सेल ट्यूमर इसमें एम्ब्रोनल कार्सिनोमा ये कल हमने कल हमने इसको Uh, जब हमने ओवेरियन ट्यूमर्स पढ़े तब हमने एम्ब्रियोनल कार्सिनोमा भी पढ़ा है एम्ब्रियोनल एज द नेम इंडिकेट्स एम्ब्रियोनल कार्सिनोमा का वर्ड यूज किया तो इट मींस दैट दिस ट्यूमर हैज एन एपिथेलियल अपीयरेंस एंड दिस ट्यूमर इज मोर अग्रेसिव देन द सेमिनोमा बट इट इज स्मॉलर एंड इट इज एसोसिएटेड विथ हैविंग ऑक थ्री फोर एंड फ्लैप पॉजिटिव प्लेसेंटल एल्कलाइन पॉजिटिविटी placental alkaline positivity is the tumor marker of this cancer and on a immunohistochemistry because it is of epithelial origin embryonic the word carcinoma is used for malignant tumor of epithelial origin so it is cytokeratin positive and cd30 positive it is secret negative if you compare it with if you compare it with seminoma seminoma is secret positive embryonal carcinoma is secret negative the additional two markers are cytokeratin ck positivity and cd30 positivity and plaq positivity now this is embryonal carcinoma ye aap aisa kitni details mein mat jao regarding embryonal carcinoma yolk sac tumor now yolk sac tumor is also known as endodermal sinus tumor ye kal humne ovarian tumors mein bhi padha and it occurs in infants and children up to 3 years old bachcho mein zyada hai agar bado mein hai it is associated with a bad prognosis bachcho mein pure forms nahi occur karti bachcho mein mixed forms it can occur in association with yolk sac tumor a yolk sac tumor can occur in association with embryonal carcinoma it can occur in association with a choreo carcinoma yani ke it means that yolk sac tumor will not occur usually as a pure form it is usually going to occur as mixed tumors whereas a yolk sac tumor if it occurs in adults it is going to be uh, 
uh, pure forms are going to be rare. So mixed in combination with embryonal carcinoma are more common in adults. Regarding the morphology, कल भी हमने ovarian tumors में पढ़ा the morphological sign कानून of this tumor is the presence of the shuller dubel body, which is a primitive glomerulus like structure, and it has a visceral layer, a parietal layer, and it resembles uh, it is a mesodermal pore with a central capillary. On immunohistochemistry, it shows intracytoplasmic and extracytoplasmic eosinophilic highline like globules which are a diagnostic feature of this tumor in addition it also shows the presence of alpha 1 anti thymocytes ye kal humne yolk sac tumor humne detail mein kal padha hai in cases of the ovarian tumor bas isme yaad rakho ki isme these tumors they produce alpha fetoprotein और माइक्रोस्कोपी में इसके अंदर एक प्रिमिटिव ग्लोमेरुलस लाइक स्ट्रक्चर होता है व्हिच इज नोन एज द शुल्डर डुबल दिस इज अ योक सैक ट्यूमर दीज आर द शुल्डर डुबल बॉडी इट हैज अ इट हैज अ लेस लाइक आप देख रहे हो स्पंजी लेस लाइक अपीयरेंस दिस इज द शुल्डर डुबल बॉडी द इनसेट इज शोइंग द शुल्डर डुबल बॉडी दीज आर द शुल्डर डुबल बॉडी This is another shallow dual body, a high power microscopic image. Corio carcinoma. ये हमने ovary में भी पढ़ा है और हमने placenta में भी पढ़ा है. This is a corio carcinoma. It is a very hemorrhagic, but dirty hemorrhagic necrotic, and it produces its metastases in the lungs. This is a corio carcinoma, a very dirty tumor showing sensitive trophoblast. these are the sensitiotrophoblast giant cells and these are the cytotrophoblast cells this is the extensive necrosis and hemorrhage which is seen in a corio carcinoma and the arrows point to the presence of the sensitiotrophoblast cells teratomas humne ekal detail mein ovary mein padhe do teen cheeze aapne teratomas mein of regarding the teratomas which occur in मेल्स में आपने जो पढ़नी है कि अगर टेराटोमास अगर बच्चों में अगर करते हैं तो दे आर बिनाइन दे आर कंसिडर टू बी बिनाइन प्री प्यूबर्टल मेल्स में टेस्टिकुलर टेराटोमास आर कंसिडर टू बी बिनाइन बट इन अ पोस्ट प्यूबर्टल चाइल्ड पोस्ट प्यूबर्टल मेल्स पोस्ट प्यूबर्टल मेल्स में टेराटोमास आर इन वेरिएबली कंसिडर टू बी मिले तो दिस इज अ टेराटोम ये सिस्टलाइक स्ट्रक्चर्स एंड दिस इज द एपिडेडिमस दिस इज द स्ट्रोटल स्टैक अ टेस्टिस व्हिच हैज बीन रिप्रोड्यूस्ड बाय अ टेरा नाउ दिस इज द माइक्रोस्कोपिक इमेज दिस इज द इमेज शोइंग द डिफरेंट कंपोनेंट्स व्हिच आर सीन इन अ टेराटोमा दिस इज द प्रिमिटिव कार्टिलेज ये कार्टिलेज ये ग्लैंड लाइक स्ट्रक्चर्स नजर आ दिस इज कार्टिलेज दिस इज एडिपोस टिश्यू sebaceous glands kyunki teratomas these are glands sebaceous glands adipose tissue and these are the chondrocytes sitting in lacteal teratoma uh, contain uh, uh, elements from all three germ layers or they contain elements from all the three germ layers so teratomas may they may occur a benign teratoma can undergo malignant transformation and the malignant transformation usually occurs in the form of a non germinal cell the importance of recognizing is that when teratomas they occur they undergo malignant transformation they become chemo resistant so in that case they are not treated with chemotherapy they are treated with surgical resection so the important point which i emphasized is that all teratomas are regarded malignant in a post pubertal male all teratomas are considered to be malignant whether they are composed of mature elements or immature elements and children mature teratomas in children they are regarded as pre pubertal children males may they are regarded as benign so that was the important point regarding teratoma standard management is all testicular enlargement should be considered to be malignant and radical orchidectomy 
based on the presumption of malignant any solid testicular tumor should be considered malignant unless it proved otherwise lymphatic spread is common retroperitoneal parotidic lymph nodes are first of involved later there is spread to the mediastinal nodes and still later to the supraclavicular lymph node so lymphatic spread is common to all types of testicular germ cell tumors hematogenous spread can occur to the lungs theek hai lymphatic spread hogi to lymph nodes pe hogi hematogenous spread hogi to, to the lungs but liver bones and brain can also get involved and remember that the histology of the metastatic deposits is usually different from that of the primary tumors because all germ cell tumors they arise from pluripotent germ cells so 70% of seminomas they are at stage 1 which is confined to the test non seminoma tests they usually present at clinical stage 2 and 3 ye humne pehle padha staging stage 1 is tumor which is confined to the testis epididymis or the spermatic cord in stage 2 it has spread beyond the confines of the testis but it the spread is confined to the retroperitoneal lymph nodes below the diaphragm in stage 3 there is spread outside the retroperitoneal lymph nodes above the diaphragm outside the retroperitoneal lymph nodes or there is spread above the diaphragm so ye stages aapko testicular tumors ki zarur aani chahiye then the role of biomarkers human gonadotropins human gonadotropins now these biomarkers or assays they can be enzymes or they are polypeptide hormones and they are secreted by the germ cell tumors and they can be detected in the blood not only are they helpful in the diagnosis their estimation or their level is helpful in the diagnosis of testicular tumors but it is also helpful in monitoring the response of tumors to therapy after therapy or after treatment the level of these biomarkers it should fall and it uh, the level of ldh is also helpful in assessing the tumor burden and it also helps in the staging of testicular germ cell tumors human chorionic gonadotropin is seen in those testicular tumors like those which contain those which contain syncytio trophoblast giant cells like seminoma 15% of seminoma contain syncytio trophoblast giant cells and very high levels of human chorionic gonadotropin are seen in cases of choriocarcinoma and 15% of seminomas then the other germs the other tumor marker is alpha fetoprotein which is seen in cases of yolk sac tumor then we have ldh the level of lactic dehydrogenase it correlates with the burden of tumor the tumor kitna volume hai after the removal of the tumor and eradication there should be a fall in these biomarkers serum alpha fetoprotein and hcg but if after serial determination you see that the levels are rising periodically there is a serial elevation it indicates recurrence or relapse before the patient serum mein pehle pata chal jata hai ke the patient has undergone a recurrence or relapse before the symptoms develop in the patient seminomas are radio sensitive remember that they are radio sensitive seminomas are radio sensitive but the non seminomatous germ cell tumors are treated with aggressive chemotherapy isliye inko do mein divide kiya hua hai ki seminomas are radio sensitive they remain localized for long periods whereas the non seminomatous germ cell tumors are um, aggressive tumors and they are treated with chemotherapy latex cell tumors and the satoli cell tumors they elaborate hormone theek hai ye these are the hormone producing tumors they can elaborate not only androgens but also estrogens and corticosteroids inke andar renki crystalloids hote hain bas ye cheez aapne yaad rakhni hai ki latex cell tumor ke cytoplasm mein you find certain needle like crystals which are composed up of they contain either lipid droplets 
lipofuxin pigment and rod shaped renki crystalloids which are detected in 25% cases and ledic cell tumors ledic cells are large polygonal round wo maine aapko dikhaya bhi tha around the seminiferous tubule ke bahar pade the these are the hormone producing this is a satoli cell tumor yellow in color because they are hormone producing and these are the satoli tubules well differentiated satoli tubule isi tarah ka in fact yahi diagram maine aapko kal ovarian tumors mein bhi dikhaya this is a satoli cell tumor composed of satoli tubules testicular lymphoma apne yaad rakhna it constitutes 5% cases and the testicular lymphomas are usually non hodgkins lymphoma and testicular lymphomas are the commonest testicular cancer which occur in individuals males older than 60 years of age and the important point to remember regarding a testicular lymphoma is that these are bilateral they are bilateral and they are non hodgkins and testicular lymphomas have a higher propensity of producing cns metastasis than the lymphomas at other sites so that finishes with the testicular
So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, my friend, dear student, Assalamualaikum. So, I am uh, Dr. Fayyaz Atif, uh, HP Chemistry Medicine. So, last time uh, we started with the non communicable diseases, and I gave you the brief introduction regarding the non communicable diseases. What are the characteristics of non communicable diseases, uh, and uh, uh, you know, why we study the non communicable diseases, etc., etc. And I gave you the list of non a large number of non communicable diseases are there. I told you what is the importance of the non communicable diseases nowadays, and as, a, as well as I told you about the burden of disease, non communicable diseases, and uh, the double burden of diseases. And then uh, we discussed two diseases, and those were very important. Related to the cardiovascular system. Number one was we discussed, uh, you know, morning artery or myocardial infarction. Okay. And secondly, we discussed uh, hypertension. Today we'll continue with the non communicable diseases and we will discuss uh, two important diseases. Number one is rheumatic heart disease and then followed by, you know, obesity. So, regarding the rheumatic heart disease, you know, firstly, as we discussed, firstly, we must define what are the objective to discuss, you know, to study different diseases. So, the objective uh, to study the rheumatic heart disease, firstly, we want to know what is actually rheumatic heart disease. Then, we want to know what is its importance regarding its uh, distribution of the disease. Worldwide distribution of disease, and then we want to know that what are the causative factors implicated in the you know occurrence of rheumatic heart disease, and uh, we'll be discussing the agent factor, host factor, and environmental factor, which are you know related to the occurrence of rheumatic heart disease, and then we'll discuss very very this is very important, particularly regarding the rheumatic heart disease. This is very, very important. That is the clinical manifestation and then the diagnostic criteria of the rheumatic heart disease. And at the end, what the strategy preventive measures, which can be taken to prevent the occurrence of rheumatic heart disease. So, firstly, you know, what is rheumatic heart disease? What is rheumatic heart disease? Rheumatic heart disease is a febrile illness. And this effect upon this has the effect upon the connective tissue of the all the connective tissue of the body, particularly heart and joint, and of course it is also you know it has also got the effect upon the brain. Okay. So basically, the brain disease affecting the connective tissue, especially you know the heart and joints and it is initiated by infection of through by group A beta hemolytic factor. So it is amazing, as I told you in the beginning, then that there are multiple risk factors in the occurrence of non communicable disease. But here, this disease is caused by the infection of the beta hemolytic factor. Then it becomes an infection disease. No. And yes, both are. You know, although it is started with the infection of the throat by the beta hemolytic streptococci, but later on it becomes non communicable. It becomes non communicable. So this is the only rheumatic, only non communicable disease. Which start with the infection of the throat by the beta hemolytic streptococci, and then you know there are a large number of manifestations of this disease, but it is non communicable. Initially, it can be communicated from one person to another person by respiratory way, you know, but later on it becomes non communicable, so therefore it is discussed as a non communicable disease. Okay. And rheumatic fever, rheumatic fever, but what is the difference between the rheumatic fever and uh, rheumatic heart disease? 
rheumatic fever is when there is no cardiac involved. I'll let you know what are the signs and symptoms, what are the different system of the body which are being involved. You know, when you know there is no cardiac involvement, you know, if the rheumatic uh, is, is, is this disease that is called rheumatic fever. When the heart is involved, then it becomes a rheumatic heart disease. And I'll, I'll let you know how the heart heart. So must be letting you know that uh, this is a crippling disease. And uh, there is a if uh, you know this disease is not treated in the initial stages when it is rheumatic fever, you know, then you know, it has got a, just uh, sequently, you know, damaging to the heart and then it becomes almost disabled. You know. There's a repeated attack of the you know disease and repeated hospitalization and even the premature death at the age of 35 years. Person may die of this. So, repeated attack of disease and then leading to the disability and repeated hospitalization and premature death. Of okay, how <coughs> this disease is? Okay, worldwide, it has been seen that there are about, uh, you know, 30 lakhs people. This they have, you know, sorry, three lakhs people they have disease annually. Okay, and it has been seen there are two lakhs death by the case occurred due to this disease. Okay, three lakhs new cases every year, year worldwide, and two lakhs death by the case. And uh, it has been seen that uh, the incidence uh, of this disease has. Lesson in the you know developed because they have come over the environmental condition. You know there is no transmission of the infection. The chances of transmission of the infection are minimal in that. So therefore the incidence of the this disease is decreasing, and definitely the mortality from the rheumatic heart disease is decreasing in the developed country. But in the developing country, still it is an important cause of. Uh, you know, disability and death in children of school going, school going children of uh, the children of five to fifteen years or five to sixteen years of age. This is an important disease. Okay, in developed country, and it has been seen the, the the prevalence of disease is six to eight per thousand student of five to sixteen years of age in the developing country, and. Uh, it is very important to know that what are the chances of getting rheumatic fever when you have this streptococcal infection? We all have at times streptococcal infection, streptococcal infection, particularly the children, school going children, children of 5 to 15 years of age. They have frequent streptococcal sore throat. But do all the streptococcal sore throat? Lead to the occurrence of the rheumatic fever? No. Only 1 to 3 percent of the streptococcal sore throat may lead to the occurrence of the rheumatic fever. It's not there, you know, I, as I have told you that uh, the disease starts with the sore throat with the epidemic streptococci. But remember it that only 1 to 3 percent of the streptococcal infection may lead to the occurrence of the rheumatic fever. So then uh, we're we'll discussing the what are the, uh, the uh, factor implicated in the causation of the disease. As I, uh, as I have told you, we'll discuss the agent factor, then host factor, and environment factor. In the agent factor, as I have told you, that uh, the rheumatic heart disease or rheumatic fever start with the, you know, streptococcal sore throat by group A beta hemolytic streptococci. So there are so many strains and so many types of the beta hemolytic streptococci and type M is involved in the causation of the rheumatic fever. There are, and so there are so many types of the beta hemolytic streptococci and so therefore, for so different people, if we are unable to, you know, make our vaccine, because of the 
variety of uh, you know uh, the unique type of industry we have to do by so we wouldn't make uh, uh, an effective vaccine so it has been seen you know still the research is going on and it is said that actually you know these are not the beta molecules that to go guy you know it, it is actually the infection start with the with the virus and uh, the virus is coxsackie b4 the coxsackie b4 virus is implicated in the causation of disease and beta hemolytic streptococci is a conditioning agent actually this is the virus but still we are not sure about it the, the, you know but we take it that it, it is basically the infection with the beta so uh, how this start i let you know how the immunity develop and how you know the protective tissues is involved i'll let you know in the next uh, you know couple of lines what are the role structures who are the people who are at more risk of having it and what are the environmental factors it has been seen that disease may occur at any age even the adult and adults and they can have the disease but the most common age for this disease is food going children 5 to of 5 to 15 years of age and uh, sex as far as concerned more male and females are in and immunity plays a very important role how this disease affects it has been seen there a theory has been presented that is called the toxic immunological hypothesis what is toxic immunological hypothesis regarding the occurrence of this disease you know definitely you know when the positive organism beta hemolytic uh, streptococci could be beta hemolytic step to back infection is there or no is there then so this is an antigen step this is an antigen and when the infection is there and the, there is a production of the antibody against uh, you know any antigen so similarly you know against the antigen or you can say the streptococcal components antibodies are put in the body of the host in the body of the human okay and it is said that these antibodies or you can say there is a immunological relationship there is a mimicking of the component of the beta hemolytic streptococci and the body tissue protective tissue of the human being you know the body is the antibodies which are produced again the streptococcal component okay and so these also you know are against the host protective tissue okay the immunological response which occurs the antibodies which are produced against the you know the streptococcal component okay these also react with the you know the host tissue and host tissue is that is the connective tissue of the human being and connective tissue which connective tissue is like the joints bone and joints as well as the connective tissue of the heart that is the you know the muscles uh, of the heart the you know the myocardium pericardium endocardium so the antibodies are basically produced against the streptococci but uh, these infected so there is a cross reaction between the component of uh, the streptococci and uh, one being connective tissue and the antibodies are produced which are produced they also cross react with the connective tissue of the human being so therefore those antibodies do the damage of the connective tissue of the human being so the chronic state it has been seen this is a disease of power overcrowding in the poor housing condition you know there is more chances because of the there is rapid transmission of the infection and uh, definitely inadequate health services are there and inadequate you know expertise no expert doctor is available to diagnose the disease at earliest possible time that is the streptococcal infection is not diagnosed timely and uh, the medicines are not given timely in the poor and overcrowding uh, uh, you know condition And that that needs to be a kind of preventive surveillance and targeting. And I group, I group, uh, I this group, I have told you these are the school children of five to fifteen years of age, and uh, those people who are living uh, close vicinity to each other, that is the club, and the uh, and the poor living conditions, like it, it can occur in adults, then in the 
direction of the game that can actually can occur. Then what are the clinical manifestation of the disease? This is very, very important and based upon the clinical manifestation of this disease and the other important criteria we diagnose the disease. I must let you know the clinical features of this disease are many. And uh, there's a galaxy of the clinical features. And all these clinical features, you know, also occur, all these clinical manifestations also occur in other diseases. I'll let you see. Like, one of the clinical features is fever. So it has been seen that the pompinus ordered to migrate fever and it starts with the starting of the streptococcal sore throat and it may be, uh, you know, be there for one to three months or even 12 weeks or, or more. So there is high grade pompinus. Then there is polyarthritis. This is very important and it is very special. Okay. The poly, what, what is polyarthritis? Polyarthritis inflammation of the multiple joints okay so there is inflammation of the you know big joint of the body particularly you know the knee joint then the elbow joint then the wrist joint so mostly these joints are big joint of the elbow and knee joint and even the ankle joint is involved <coughs> but uh, in few cases you know the you know the interfalangeal joint the joints of the hand and you know and but it is very so polyarthritis. There is painful inflammation. So important thing regarding the polyarthritis of rheumatic fever is this is splitting in time. This is migratory in time. You know the one joint is involved, like the hip joint is involved firstly, and then this move to the that that get all right. Then it goes goes to the knee joint. Then it get all right. Then it move to the ankle joint. Okay. Then similarly, you know, the, uh, there may be involvement of uh, the elbow joint, okay, and then it get all right, and then the other joint, the wrist joint is involved. So it is splitting in time. It is migratory in time. One joint is in place that that uh, get all right, and then you know the inflammation goes to the other joint. So this does not happen in the other diseases mostly. So it is migratory only arthritis. Hard right. Carditis is the inflammation of the heart. So all the layers, there is pancarditis, all the layer of the pericarditis, myocarditis, endocarditis, and uh, this, the manifestation may depending upon whether mostly you know the pericardium is involved, chest pain, myocardium is involved, then there may be you know uh, uh, you uh, you know uh, the heart rate may be irregular and uh, that may lead to, you know, the uh, congestive cardiac failure. Endocarditis involved, there may be vital stenosis, vital incompetence, aortic stenosis, aortic incompetence, leading to the different types of, you know, uh, the MER, but depending upon which type of involved. So, carditis may be pericarditis, myocarditis, endocarditis, but it is seen mostly it is the endocarditis and the mostly the wall which is involved, that is the there may be vital stenosis or vital incompetence, you know, that can be the endocardial process or by clinical screening. Then the other, you know, manifestation is after the fever, polyarthritis, and uh, then the carditis, then subcutaneous process. So these are not in all the patients of the, you know, the, the in all the patients of uh, uh, rheumatic uh, fever, rheumatic heart disease, it occurs in less than 2% of the okay. And, uh, you know, the reduced develop after 4 weeks after the onset of the rheumatic fever. And these are the small nodules ranging from, you know, uh, a few millimeters to a half centimeter. You know, these are under the skin. Under the skin, few millimeter in size. These are not tender, non tender, and these are seen over the, you know, the extensive surface of the joint, over the elbow, over the knee, over the ankle, on the 
knuckle of the uh, you know hands okay and these are uh, these remain for variable time this disappear you, you can see in the picture you know there are small nodules on the knee on the on the uh, you know knuckles on the feet etc small nodules and these are painless painless okay but i'll let you know you know these could be very other other disease as well the chorea what is chorea the and why is this occur the chorea occurs uh, when the brain in okay, you know due to the involvement of the brain okay the basal when basal ganglia are involved then you know abnormal movement of the body definitely you can go body movement then the abnormal body movement appear appear what is chorea chorea the hidden chorea that occur in old age and this is the hidden m chorea hidden m chorea so these are irregular rapid irregular jerky movement and aimless you know you know the person develops rapidly jerky movement like that and then this finish so rapid irregular pain, pain, in involuntary you know purposeless or aimless movement of the arms they may be movement of the legs or even in the movement of the face or movement in front so it develops suddenly and then the suddenly suddenly like that suddenly a movement of the face okay so this, this is called the sudden hand body of the name of a person you know it's covered the sudden hand okay so this is there is a rapid jerky movement so this is the fog you know make the sign of the you know rheumatic fever if there are no other sign and symptoms and only the chorea is there and you can say that this is something from the or rheumatic fever from the part but it occurs only in 25 percent of the case then the other will be erythema marginis erythema marginis is a peculiar pinkish rash okay peculiar pinkish so if there is a in the skin you know the skin is Uh, there is macular rash in the skin. This is become a pink, a pink and suspicious irregular part. The irregular uh, part is there. Edges are irregular. So rash and uh, it appears in the form of ring, as you can see uh, uh, in this picture. Uh, small rings are there. They may be of different sizes, from few millimeter to few centimeters. irregular uh, it a uh, rash red rash which have irregular margin and it is pink but in the center it fades outline is red but in the center you know it fades and it is comparatively a less red or you can say white as compared to the outer margin so this is called the erythema red part in the epidermal part pale in the center and slightly red at the periphery or at the margin and at the margin it is little bit it is called the erythema marginis and it occurs only 10% of the cases of the rheumatic then arthralgia what is the difference between the arthritis and arthritis arthralgia is the pain due to inflammation of the joint arthralgia means pain joint pain. the joint and there may not be slippage the joint may in arthritis there the joints are in pain red and hot in case of arthralgia simply there there is joint pain so arthralgia is there and definitely the, as i told you the knee joint wrist joint elbow joint or at times the joint of the of, of the heel is there or hip flexor joint then the other You know, sign maybe or symptom previous history of the rheumatic fever. A person comes to you, you know, with all these signs or few signs and symptom of the disease, and he may give the history that I had this disease, and in which you know these are the signs and symptoms. He may give his previous history of all these signs and symptoms, and I will diagnose as rheumatic fever. This is also taken to be one of the signs of the disease. And then when we do some laboratory tests, 
updated in field in PTSD. I do so I that the patient is in key again key reactor protein, so they divide in between reactive protein, but key reactive protein shows it shows the inflammation. It is not specific to the rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease. You know, it's a non-specific and a key reactive protein these are raised in any the condition of the body that shows the inflammation uh, of the body and uh, the level may be if it is more than eight eight uh, more than eight then it is uh, less than eight uh, uh, stronger leukocytes the leukocytes we have seen best prolonged PR in terms of prolonged PR in terms of to the cardiac failing particularly the cross log or any part of the block was using a key but then supportive evidence of uh, preceding streptococcal infection means there is an evidence that the uh, you know before the sign and symptom occurrence of the sign and symptom the person had the sore throat has the sore throat streptococcal sore throat that is the preceding evidence preceding evidence of the streptococcal infection within 40 Five days when the person comes to you, presenting polyarthritis, fever, erythema marginative, okay, chorea, or few of these symptoms, and he also gives the history of the sore throat, and he says that I had the sore throat. He will not say that I had this, I had the septopical infection. Definitely, if he had the report of the culture report of the throat, and that shows that he had, you know. Uh, streptococcal infection within you know last 45 days then again we can call the supportive evidence of the rheumatic then ECG ECG you know of course as I told you it shows the increased PR in terms that should be given better yes yeah, so anti streptolysis jitter increasing uh, uh, anti streptolysis ASOT and the streptolysis OT. So, firstly, it was 100 milligrams per DL, then 150, uh, 250, 300, so every 300 and more. So, it is increasing. You know, if this is uh, the pattern is like that, increasing ASOT and it goes beyond 300 milligrams, that it means that the person. A, you know, and a streptococcal infection, of course, which is one of the tests which uh, shows that the person is suffering from the rheumatic disease. Then, anti DNA, anti hyaluronitis, anti protein, all these are the supportive evidence of having this. Definitely, I told you, both, uh, you take the core culture, and then, then uh, you know, if uh, there is streptococcal infection, Positive, or you can see the rapid antigen test. So, for the uh, uh, sore throat, that you have the culture, and then uh, you know that report comes, uh, you know, after a few days, after 48 hours. But uh, there is rapid antigen test. You do the test and get the step to the right and see on this side that is called the rapid and, uh, uh, antigen test to call the blue team step to the right rather than as the culture. So, this is one of the supporting the body and okay now what is important the important thing is are all these things shows that the person is having you know rheumatic uh, fever like the fever as I have told you in the clinical manifestation the fever fever maybe there is so many diseases in all the infection, almost the fever is there, whether it is malaria, whether it's thyroid fever, you know, whether it's tuberculosis, whether it's sore throat, viral sore throat, the sore throat by other, you know, uh, uh, you know, bacteria, you know, all they have, you know, there's a fever. Fever is a non specific. So fever can occur in any disease. Like I told you, it's an anthema marginative. Erythema marginative can occur in many other diseases, like in allergic reaction. You know, the erythema marginative can occur uh, 
even uh, in sepsis, you know, uh, the erythema paginated can occur. And similarly, in uh, you can say the uh, uh, angioedema, the, you know, erythema paginated can be occur in glomerular nephritis. The erythema marginative can occur. So erythema marginative is not specific. It can occur in any disease. Similarly, you know, the chorea. Chorea can occur in many other diseases, like uh, uh, in uh, hypocalcemia, the chorea can occur, hyperglycemia, the chorea can occur, and similarly, uh, in uh, you can say, like uh, hypernatremia, the chorea can occur. The chorea can occur in hepatic failure. So all these the chorea, the erythema marginative, the fever, they, uh, it can occur. And similarly, the arthritis, arthritis can occur in hepatic arthritis, septic arthritis, and arthralgia can occur in any disease. So all these signs and symptoms which I have given to you, and you know, uh, similarly the C-reactive that may be raised in any other disease. So all these signs and symptoms, these can occur in many diseases. So how we can know that this is due to be dramatic? So there was a question. And even, you know, 80 years back, so Mr. Uh, Jones, Dr. Jones, he developed a right. And he took the galaxy of the symptoms. He took the all the galaxy of the symptoms, and he divided all these signs and symptoms into major manifestation, major clinical presentation, and minor manifestation. So minor clinical feature. Okay. So and then he he devised the criteria for the diagnosis. You know, according to the Dr. Johns, he devised the criteria in nineteen. 40, and later on it was revised, and it has been revised many times. And lastly, it was revised in 2002 in by the WHO. You know, according to the revised Dukat criteria, so he has divided all the signs and symptoms to major manifestation and minor manifestation. In the, among the major manifestation, the carditis, polyarthritis, chorea, erythema marginative, and subcutaneous. So these five, number one, carditis, polyarthritis, chorea, erythema marginative, and subcutaneous nodule, these are among the major manifestations. And among the minor manifestation, you know, fever, arthralgia, not arthritis, arthritis is major. Arthralgia, this previous issue of rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease, ESR, and the C-reactive protein, leukocytosis, and we are interested, these are the minor manifestations. Now, we have two types of the symptoms, major manifestation and minor manifestation. Now, how we can diagnose the disease? You know, WHO, you know, expert committee in 1988, you know, it develops a criteria and uh, the criteria is, if in a person there is one Two major manifestations, two major manifestations, like one and one, two major manifestations and two major manifestations are there. Plus, there is a laboratory supportive evidence. Supportive evidence, what is that supportive evidence? Is the obstetrical infection, that is by the sore throat, okay? So, and ASO titer, raising ASO titer or anti DNA, anti -DNA. Okay, so two major manifestations. Plus streptococcal infection, history of streptococcal infection, and that can be diagnosed by the culture of the, of the throat. Culture of the throat, okay, taking the culture of the throat and plus rising ASO titer and DNAs, then that can be diagnosed. Two major manifestations. Or another thing is one major manifestation and two minor manifestations. Plus history of streptococcal infection and uh, you know the rising ASO titer that we can diagnose. So this is the way how we diagnose the disease. How we diagnose the rheumatic fever. But there are certain other conditions in which you know all these are not there.
there and let me know what is in there in that case what is the criteria like uh, a diagnostic category in the diagnostic criteria as you can see in this slide if there is a primary episode of the rheumatic first attack of the rheumatic then how with the what will be the criteria that is the same two major manifestation for supportive laboratory exam or one major manifestation plus two minor manifestation and supportive you know evidence lab that, that is step to focus poster that may be that if the person is suffering first time so if the person having the second time rheumatic heart fever is coming to you and he is coming to you you know uh, uh, second time okay then and he do not have the uh, the murmur he do not have to have the card access center uh, and he, he do not uh, have the any evidence of the involvement of the heart okay. coming second time no involvement of the heart then again the same right two major major manifestations plus left the body or one major manifestation two minor manifestation plus the body okay. so this will be the diagnostic right then if the person is coming okay he has the rheumatic uh, disease uh, and uh, he has uh, the you know involvement of the heart okay establish uh, as establish the heart disease like uh, on the echograph cardiography you know there is a valvular uh, involvement or uh, there is a myocarditis or there is peri uh, peri uh, carditis you know if there is any proof of that then what will you do you will do that uh, to reduce the diagnosis only two minor manifestation two minor manifestation uh, uh, plus lab evidence that is that the reporting right no major manifestation no one major manifestation plus two minor manifestation only two minor manifestation plus lab evidence of the septal infection in case of recurrent attack with the cardiac involvement so this is the third category then the fourth category if the person is having rheumatic pneumonia sudden pneumonia okay and you know and there is evidence of the card that is there may be cardiac murmur or you have echocardiography report in which shows the involvement of the heart okay then you don't need anything you don't need anything okay so there is no need of other lab test or there is no uh, you you need to you know, need uh, the uh, other manifestation major or minor manifestation person is simply coming with the abnormal body movement that is chorea plus evidence of the involvement of the heart then only that is sufficient you see the same these are the views of the rheumatic heart and the other condition is that if a person have uh, you know confirm finding of the heart involvement heart involvement that is of rheumatic heart disease okay you have you know the echocardiography that you see that there is vital stenosis vital insufficient okay uh, uh, vital in, uh, uh, incompetence or other valves are involved then again for this chronic valvular disease and uh, this person is in the of order you don't need all the major manifestation of heart disease that is sufficient to this okay so how we can try to address that as you know that this disease occur in specific ages in specific community overcrowded okay and uh, uh, you know and it occurs by it is treated by septopupal stool so the root cause of this disease is the streptococcal group infection with the group a beta hemolytic streptococcus correct it start with that 
So how we can prevent the rheumatic, rheumatic heart? Simply is there that you treat all those people who have the streptococcal sore throat. How we can treat it? We can diagnose it. How we can diagnose it? By the sign and symptom, and then you take the sore swab and culture it and get the report of the culture and give the treatment. And the treatment is that it depends the, you know, the treatment of the choices depends the, or um, uh, you can say you can give the oral penicillin or injectable penicillin or peritomycin as that is in the treatment. Okay. So all these sore throat that should have a swabbing sore throat swab and culture and get the report and treat it by the company. But do you know it is possible in poor community, in developed country, it may be possible to get the swab and culture it. But it is next to impossible in a country like Pakistan or in other developed countries. So what to do then? What to do then? So the remedy of this problem is the solution to this problem is the all sports food that should be taken that these are the streptococcal infection and those should be given this thing. So all sore throat, without swabbing, without getting it cultured, they should be assumed that they have the streptococcal infection. And particularly in the risk age group, that is the 5 to 15 years of age group, you know, if they have all the signs and symptoms or few symptoms or simply sore throat and fever, then give them the proper treatment. And what is treatment in case of adults? More than 12 years of age, so you give the adult treatment, you give them 1.2 billion units. Like uh, 1 million is equal to 10 lakhs, that is the 12 lakh units of benzethine penicillin. Benzethine penicillin intramuscularly, and uh, that should be given for 10 days to adults. And to the children below 12 years of age, you give the 6,000 units, 6,000 units, uh, or if they are uh, 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 benzathine penicillin for 10 days, or or you can give the oral penicillin, that is the penicillin B, penicillin B, and that is the oral penicillin, you can give the oral penicillin for 10 days, and if the person is allergic to penicillin, then you give another choice, that is azithromycin, you can give an azithromycin, the drug of choice, and that is Adult as well as uh, to the children, to the adult, 500 milligrams, you know, BB for uh, uh, even the 10 days, and for children, uh, 250 milligrams, BB for 10 days. So, this is the thing. Second, second, you know, early diagnosis and you know, get to prevent so that uh, there is no recurrence of the problem. Okay? And uh, what you do is, uh, you know, you Diagnose it by all these, you know, by keeping it to sign and symptom, and then having the sore culture, and then ASO teacher, G reactive protein, you diagnose at earliest possible time. And if there is no carditis, no carditis, you have diagnosed, you know, first of all, the prevention. Because, you know, I told you in the previous slides, sir. You know, in the primary prevention, what you do, you are not sure that the person is having kidney disease. Having simple sore throat and you prevent the occurrence of rheumatic fever there. Rheumatic fever is not there. But if all the signs and symptoms are there, plus the lab evidence is there, and you have uh, you applied the Jones criteria, two major manifestation plus lab evidence, or one major manifestation, two minor manifestation plus lab evidence, if you are diagnosed a person that the person is suffering from rheumatic fever without carditis, no heart involvement, no valvular involvement, only you know rheumatic fever, all the signs and symptoms, no murmur is there, no congestive cardiac failure is there, no chest pain due to the you know the pericarditis. You know, if only you know the simple rheumatic fever is there, then but treatment should be given and for how long? Again, you know, you give the 
1.2 billion adult or 0 0.6 million that is the declared unit of benzene in penicillin for three weeks for three weeks okay you know for three weeks three, uh, you give them for 10 days and then uh, for five years you continue treatment after every three weeks people usually give after every for every you know month you give this treatment for 10 days every month and after every three weeks you know you give this treatment then another uh, after, after three weeks you give for 10 days then for uh, for another one you give for 10 days you have to continue it for five years for five years, after every three weeks, you give this treatment of, you know, 1.2 billion units of the benzene for five weeks. Or if the person or the child is there, or up to the age of 18, up to the age of, if the child is of 15 years and up to the age of 18 years, 18 years will come after three years. So you don't have to give for three years. You will prefer that. You, you prefer that the other choice for five years. And if the, the child is of, uh, of eight years, and then you, you can continue for three years. So whichever is the longest, whichever is the longest, you give that. So if the patient is at the card, that is the vital value called vital fever index, vital incompetence. Or the yield card item, then the treatment should be given for 10 rather than the 5. Or until the person at the age of 25. Okay. Then uh, the third one is uh, if uh, you know there is uh, more valvular damage, then definitely that should be surgery along with the you know, treat lifelong treatment with the penis. Now, with severe valvular severe valvular disease, you, you need a valvular surgery and treatment should be of the value that that should be continued for the whole of the life. The non-medical measures, what are non-medical measures? As you know, that what is the vulnerable age? Definitely, and uh, uh, you know, what are the conditions which lead to the epilepsy? Poor social economic conditions. Are there, you know, overcrowding? Okay, and uh, definitely you non medical measure is, you know, there should be close proximity and close proximity, particularly the person suffering from poor food, they should have the immediate treatment and uh, there should be no, no overcrowding. Okay. They should treat the good condition and then the overcrowding. Then evaluation. You know, this program should be evaluated uh, here. It is advised uh, that the surveys should be conducted in school children, and the sample of the school children should be taken uh, after every four to five years, and then you get the school culture of all like the get uh, 300 children from a bigger school and get the school culture of school children and see how many people they have seen uh, you know, in the type of and then, of course, you implement all these measures, get them treated, okay, and then again, after a few years, you again have the, you can evaluation your program, whether these are the uh, treatment which you are giving or the control measure which you are taking, or the success or not. Okay, I intended to have another topic, and that was the uh, university. I have time 10 minutes uh, and uh, let me see how I can cover because we have shortage of time. We do not have so much upper 10 time to cover all your syllabus. So, therefore, uh, let me continue with the other topic that is the obesity. How do you know? Other topic? How do you know? Slide change.
But the other topic is opacity. What is opacity and how we can treat it or how we can prevent it in your childhood? Okay. You know, in this lecture, we'll know, you know, what is the magnitude of opacity? How common this? I, I can say this is a disease. Opacity is a disease, a non communicable disease, and how common it is in Pakistan and worldwide. And what are the different types of opacity? There are types like other, like uh, many other diseases, like obesity is of different types. Then, what are the causes of obesity or determinant of obesity? And then we classify the obesity based upon the age of the person, height of the person. You know, it is like malnutrition, first degree malnutrition, second degree malnutrition, third degree malnutrition, hypertension, mild, moderate, severe hypertension. Similarly, definitely, people have, uh, you know, they, they are, uh, few people, they are less obese as compared to the other people. So, I'll let you know what is the classification, how you classify the obesity. And uh, then uh, how we can assess it, that this person is obese and this person is obese. Okay. And degree of obesity. And then definitely, what are the hazards okay. related to the obesity? Because obesity is a hazard for many diseases. I'll let you know what are the diseases which can occur in obese person. And lastly, the preventive measures for the best law, we can get the best prevented at community level and definitely, particularly at the personal level. You know, obesity, what is obesity? Who are the obese person? So, what happens in the person? So, obesity, we can define the abnormal growth of adipose the fatty tissue. The person may be obese due to the muscular tissue. The person may be obese due to the retention of water. You know, the, the person may be obese due to the edema. You know, but he may be obese. But what is obesity? He may be obese due to many other reasons. So obesity is actually the deposition of the fatty tissue in the body. You can say the growth of the adipose of fatty tissue and how the fatty tissue is it grows this, this fatty cell may be enlarged size of the fat cell may be enlarged cell size may be or the number of the cell may be definitely the person will get obese when there is more fat deposition in the cell and the cell may enlarge or the number of the cell cell may multiply and number of the cell may increase so in both cases the enlargement of the, the deposition of the fatty tissue or in the body or increase in, due to increase in the fats in the cell or increase in the number of cells that is the obesity. Another definition is has been given the, the normal weight, the standard weight of that particular age at of a particular sex, you know, that is a specific weight for that each for that height. So if there is more than 10% of that normal weight, 10% excess of the normal weight, desirable weight, then it is called the obesity. And another, you know, I will see the classification, BMI more than 30. BMI more than 30. What is BMI I used to ask for? All the people, what is BMI? You know what they say. BMI is here. The BMI is for the mass index. This is for the mass index. And what you answer in the Bible was this is basal metabolic index. You answer is basal metabolic index. Well, it is not basal metabolic index. It is body mass index. How the body mass index is calculated, I'll let you know body mass index calculated the weight of the person kilogram, like my weight may be 70 kilograms, then divided by height, height like you may be 1.6 meter, 
1.6 meter, but it is not simply the height. Scale of the height, 1.6 scale. Weight 70 divided by 1.6 meter scale. That is the BMI, body mass index. And if the body mass index weight divided by height scale is more than 30, then the person is called the obese. The types of obesity. What are different types of obesity? The types of obesity is hyperplasty. Hyperplasia, hyperplasia, hyperplasia. What is hyperplasia? Hyperplasia is number of the cells that increase, doesn't it? You know, hyperplastic body and uh, uh, you know number of the size of the uh, hypertrophy. You know, it, uh, I think this is uh, hyperplastic, hypertrophy. You know, hyperplasty and uh, I think it's it's a it's a just uh, you know uh, miss. Uh, I think written here, an enlargement in the fat cell size. It's not enlargement in the fat cell size. And the enlargement in the fat cell size is hypertrophy. You know, hyperplastic mean an increase in the fat cell number. That is hyperplastic. And hypertrophic mean, you know, the it should be uh, an enlargement in the fat cell size, not enlargement in fat cell size, the number of the cell size. Then hyper. Uh, uh, trophic mean in, in these in the cell size. Okay. So when the hyperplastic mean the number of the body cells are enlarged, then that is called the hyper hyper plastic obesity. Number of the cells. Okay. Hypertrophy means when the size uh, the size of the cell increases. That is called it. Android obesity. Android obesity. Android means you know, male type of obesity. So predominantly the fat deposition is there in the abdominal. Abdominal, you know, the belly is in okay. You know, that is called the <coughs> android obesity, male like obesity, predominantly the abdominal fat distribution is much more as compared to the other body distribution. Gynoid obesity, gynoid obesity is the fat deposition is there, but it is equally distributed all over the body. Predominantly, you know, the abdomen is not. So there are three, four types. Of, of, of the obesity, hyperplastic, hypertrophic, gynoid, android obesity. You know. Then classification of the obesity depending on the size. It may be the last slide. The classification of the, you know, depending upon the BMI. As I have told you, how we calculate the BMI, we calculate the BMI, we divide the weight of the person by the height of the person in scale. As I told you, if the weight is 70 kg and height is 1.6 meter, 70 divided by 1.6 meter scale, and the value will come in like that. Like so, that will be BMI. So, depending upon the BMI, who will be underweight? The underweight is person whose BMI is less than 80, less than 18.5. You you have if you divide the weight by the the scale root of the uh, height, then if, if the reading comes less than 80, then you are under. And who are the uh, normal weight? The normal weight are if the BMI is from 18.5, we say usually from 18 to 25, 24.9. From 18 to 25, that is the normal. No, this is underweight, normal age. And who are the overweight? Overweight are those who are more than 25. More than 25 BMI. And then we again you may be a 26, you may be a 36, you may be a 56. So then we have further classified those people who are having BMI more than 25. So more than 25, we have divided, further are divided. And uh, those who are having the BMI from 25 to 30 or 29.9, 25 to 30, they are free obese. And who are obese from obese class one? 30 to 35. I mean, eventually you say, just to remember it rather than saying the 34.99, 29.99. You can remember that. Obese degree 1, 30 to 35. Obese degree 2, 35 to 40. Uh, obese degree 3, more than 40. So, you know, 
we can classify it into and then I think the time is over and we will be involved by the system. In the next section, and along with it, we will have the other discussions. Particularly, I think uh, I will be discussing the cancer in different dimensions. Okay, thank you very much. Rather than general, I think it's better to discuss only the diabetes. Next time, we will discuss BMI and the diabetes lighter. Secondly, I must announce here. You know, you may you you are going to have your term test. Okay, we'll uh, put this notice uh, on uh, your WhatsApp group of the fourth year. You will be having your term test on Monday. If the classes will be starting, we'll let you know the time of having you know uh, the term test, community medicine term test in campus. We'll let you know the time. You know if the classes will be on. The college start, and if even the college does not start, you will be having your term test, and, and we'll give the MCQ 65 MCQ online term test of the common dimension on coming Monday. Okay, in both cases, whether the college starts, college open, you'll be having in campus, and if the college does not start, you will be having online. You know, uh, in online, we'll just be giving the MCQ, and if you know the college starts, you know, then we'll have the MCQ as well as SEQ. We'll let you know regarding the timing. Let's see whether the college open, and uh, we'll let you know within a day or two what the timing in case the college starts.